Good morning, Grove Church. Welcome to our online experience. My name is Shelly, and if today you're joining us for the first time, I want to welcome you. We are so excited that you are here, and we want to connect with you. So please go to this link below and fill out our online connection card and indicate that you are a first-time guest, and we would love to send you a gift this week. Today, we have an incredible message in store, but first, let's start with lifting up the name of Jesus together. So get ready, church, because worship starts now.
Several years ago, when my twin daughters, they're teenagers now, but they were, they were little girls and their rooms were overflowing with stuffed animals. Anyone else hasn't seen a little girl's room that's overflowing with stuffed animals? And so when you go to put them to bed tonight, you literally, there's nowhere for them to lay. The stuffed animals have covered the bed. There's not even any empty space for them to lay their head down. And we heard that there was a local dance studio in town that was collecting stuffed animals that they were going to be giving them out at the Titusville Christmas Parade. So my wife, Shelly, thought it was an incredible idea to, to secretly go into our girls' rooms while they're at school and to gather stuffed animals to donate to this dance studio. So she did that, and she, she cleared out their room, and, and dozens of stuffed animals went missing that day. Well, as the weeks led up to the Christmas parade, we were getting ready and we were talking to our family and our friends of where we were going to watch the parade from. And we found our spot on US-1 and we were all situated and all the kids, you guys know, were lined the curb. And, and I believe it was a cool night. They had hot chocolate and it was all exciting for the parade. And so as the different floats came by, they were throwing candy and the kids were going nuts. And it was a great evening. And, and here comes down US-1, these dancing ladies handing out stuffed animals. And my girls catch eye that, man, they're giving out stuffed animals. They're not just giving out lollipops. They're giving out full-grown stuffed animals. And they got so excited. And, and I don't know if you guys are going to believe me when I tell you this, but as those dancers approached and got closer to where my family was sitting, this one particular woman come over with a couple stuffed animals, and she catches eye contact with my twin daughters, and, and she hands my daughter Mia this stuffed animal. Mia grabs the stuffed animal and she's looking at it and she turns instantly to her mom and says, Mom, how did she get my stuffed animal? <laughs> no lie, that really happened. We donated these stuffed animals and somehow it returned back to my daughter. And I know what some of you are thinking, you guys are the worst parents in the world. Like, but before you judge us, before you judge us, how many guys by a show of hands have ever re-gifted something? You ever re-gifted something? All right, I'm in good company here, okay? I'm in good company. We've all re-gifted something, and that's kind of like a phrase that's been made popular the last several years of when you receive a gift that maybe you're not too interested in or have much use for, you find another party or event or, or work party to re-gift that gift and say, you know what, this would be better situated for someone else. And so I have some examples. And so maybe these are some gifts that, that you've opened, uh, such as maybe you opened a Christmas gift and you received one of these. Anyone received one of these? This, you might think it's a scarf, but really it's a rabbi starter kit. All right. And so, <laughs> but you know, I, I'm not really into that. I'm not really a scarf wearing type of guy. And so I would say, you know, this is great. But I think I'm going to re-gift that. I'm going to take that to uh, my family gathering with some distant cousins. And one of them it will probably work well for. Or maybe you've received a gift like this. Anybody know what this is? The famous fruit cake, right? Like fruit cake. Like here, here's, the, here's a cue as you give out gifts this year. If you give someone a gift and they open it and they say out loud what the gift is. Like they say, oh, fruit cake. That's universal for it. They don't like that gift. <laughs> if they say what the gift is out loud, they do not like it. And so you, everyone would open this and be like, fruitcake. That's going to the company party, and I will re-gift that. Or something like this. This says elf earwax candle, right? Elf's earwax candle. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? This is definitely 
getting re-gifted. And so we've all been there. We've all re-gifted something. We've received these gifts that we have no use for, we're not interested in, and we find a new home for this gift. Well, we're starting Advent today as we enter into the Advent season. Uh, and and I, I want to say, what if we flip it around? Instead of giving away the things or re-gifting the things that we have no interest in, or, or we do not care for, or we would uh, have no use for, what if we re-gifted the things that were the best gifts we've ever received? For example, maybe you've received a gift, or you've eaten at a restaurant, or you've seen a movie this season that, that is so good that you want everyone you know to have that same experience. You ever had something like that? Like you've received a gift, and you said, man, I have to get one of these For my brother, I have to get one of these for my mom. This is the greatest gift. Everyone needs this. Or you've eaten at a restaurant and you just want everyone to know how good this restaurant is and they need to experience it for themselves. For me, for example, I'm particularly favorable of this restaurant, one of the local restaurants in Titusville. It's called Ice House right here on US1. I love Ice House. I eat there like four times a week. I'm not joking to you. Like that's not an exaggeration. That is reality. I think it's one of Titusville's uh, best kept secrets. People don't know about Ice House. They don't know they've ever been in there. They, They don't recognize it. But I'm telling you, it's incredible. And I want everyone to experience it because it is, it's a treat. And so this is what I did just to kind of give you an example. I have an Ice House gift card right here for $50. Who wants Ice House gift card for $50? You got to come get it. The first person to come get it right here. Uh, Man, Reggie. Hey, it helps to sit up front. That will teach you uh, back row church sitters, right? And so, you know, but what if we re-gifted the things that were the greatest gifts we ever received? And as we go into Advent, Advent really is the four weeks leading up to Christmas. Maybe that's a term that you've heard, but you're not really sure what it is. That's okay. Advent is just the four weeks leading up to Christmas Day. It's a time of preparation where we prepare our hearts to celebrate the arrival of Christ. Now, some of you are saying, Brad, that happened thousands of years ago. I know that. And so Advent, what we do is we are celebrating and we're remembering and preparing to celebrate the arrival of Christ and remembering the gift that God gave us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. But we're also eagerly anticipating his return. And so as we work our way through the Advent season, we're going to focus on these these gifts that come through the person of Jesus, these gifts like joy and love and peace and hope as we prepare our hearts to celebrate. In this first week of Advent, I want to look at how can we re-gift Hope. And not hope as in the way that our culture views hope today. Like we tend to view hope as wishful thinking. Well, I hope I win the lottery. Well, I hope he finally gets a job. Like it's kind of like wishful thinking. But I'm talking about true biblical hope. And true biblical hope is not wishful thinking, but it's confident assurance. What does it mean to be so confident? and assure that something is going to happen. A confidence in God that no matter our current situation, we are, fit, we are hopeful that he will see us through, that he will never abandon us or forsake us, that he will always lead us, guide, and provide for us. And maybe this Christmas season, or maybe Christmas season in general, is your favorite time of year. Maybe you're filled with hope and and celebration and and you look forward all year long to the time where you get to gather with friends and and family and and you love this season. That's incredible. It's incredible that you have that excitement and that anticipation and that hope. But I want us to understand that that's not the case for everyone. And the reality is this, that many people, this season is the hardest time of year for them. And maybe it's based on grief that they're walking through if they've lost a loved one. Maybe it's marital struggles or, or, or broken families. Maybe it's financial stress or, or the, the effects of addiction. There, there, there's a whole gauntlet of things where there's people who are coming into this season and, and really this past week and, and for the remaining of this year just thinking, man, like I'm dreading this next month because they're hurting. And, and really? Many of them feel hopeless based on their situation, based on their experiences, based on on what they feel like they can never get out of. 
Hal Lindsey, he's an author and pastor, he says this, that man can live about 40 days without food, about three days without water, and about eight minutes without air, but only for one second without hope. And I just want to look at a moment, like what are some of the things in our life that, that cause us to feel hopeless? What are some of these things? And there's some blanks in your program. You can write these down, but, but maybe you even have some of your own ideas that you can write down in these blanks of things that are making you feel hopeless if that's your situation this morning. But you know, our circumstances can make us feel hopeless, can't they? Our circumstances, whether they be relational or financial or physical, I mean, many, many of you maybe are in situations and circumstances that you feel like it's just no way that it's going to get better. It's not going to improve, and the result of that is hopelessness. Maybe it's negative talk from yourself or from your spouse or, or from coworkers or from strangers or maybe even from news broadcasters, but maybe there's negative talk and it's, and it's flooding you and everywhere you turn, you're hearing this pessimistic view and it's causing you to feel hopeless. You know, maybe it's fatigue and maybe you've been in this current situation or circumstance for months or even years. And to just be real honest, you're just saying, you know what? Like, I just don't know how much more I can take. I'm tired. I'm not just physically, but I'm, I'm emotionally and I'm spiritually, I'm relationally tired. I don't know if I can keep on keeping on. Or maybe it's doubt. And just the doubt and the unbelief that anything could ever change, that your circumstance can change or that anything positive can happen to you. These are things that cause us to, to feel hopeless. But if you're here and you're an individual that say, I have hope, I have hope. And I, I want to look at the next few moments for those of us who'd say, man, I, I am hopeful. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for this time of year. I'm hopeful for what God has in store for me and, and for my family and for our community and for this church. I'm hopeful. And I want to look at for the next few moments, well, how do those of you who have hope, how do you re-gift this hope? How do you share that hope with others that you encounter in these coming weeks, specifically as we work our way through this Advent season? I, I want to look at part of the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. And in, in, in Luke chapter 2, we can kind of, we see the story, but there, there's an individual who's not as known as maybe some of the others. And as we think about the Christmas stories, we think about the nativity scenes that, that maybe you've already seen some put out this week. You're starting to see them pop up around town and we think of the wise men and we think of the shepherds and we think of Mary and Joseph. But I want to look at someone this morning real quick. He's mentioned briefly in the Christmas story and his name is Simeon. And I want to read in Luke chapter 2, verse 25 through 35. It says, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying this, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Simeon it was this man that, that God had given a promise. And his promise was, hey, before you die, you will personally see the Messiah. And so we see this story of Mary and Joseph and taking baby Jesus to the temple to have him dedicated. And that's what we do here with child dedication a couple times a year. And this was part of their Jewish customs. And Simeon had gotten word by the Holy Spirit that this was the time to go to the temple. And he was there, and when he saw Mary and Joseph and he saw Jesus, he said, man, this is him. This is what the Lord had promised me. And he spoke this incredible words over Jesus and to the mother and father of our Savior. But this, this was incredible. And the first thing I want us to see, if we're going to re-gift hope, looking at the story of Simeon, the first thing we need to see is that our hope needs to be authentic. 
Our hope needs to be authentic. Simeon's hope was authentic because it was based on the promises of God. You see, all of his hope, his eager anticipation was based on the promise that the Spirit of God gave him. I mean, if we're going to re-gift hope, we need to make sure we're re-gifting authentic hope, not some type of knockoff hope. There's nothing worse than on Christmas Day, opening your gifts, waiting for this gift, eagerly anticipating this gift that you've made on your list and you've let your family and your spouse know, children you've let Santa Claus know, whoever, and then opening that gift only to find a knockoff gift. You know, it would be like this. It would be like, all I want for Christmas is a pair of retro throwback Nike Air Jordans. Them things are sweet, right? Them things are sweet. And then Christmas Day coming, and you open the package only to find Shaq shoes. <laughs> Nobody wants Shaq shoes. They're not valuable. They're not collectible. You want Air Jordans. That's a knockoff brand. That's a knockoff shoe, right? Or what about Marvels? One of the greatest Marvel, my favorite Marvel action figure of all, the Incredible Hulk. And maybe you've had your eyes set on this action figure for months and months and months, and I can't wait to play with my Incredible Hulk, only to open that box on Christmas morning and find this, the Revengers Incredible Fella. <laughs> Where the heck did he come from? I've never heard of the Incredible Fella. It's the Incredible Hulk. But we have these knockoff gifts, or you know, even worse than all of those combined would be just my only desire is to have a classy, nice, quality hoodie, Florida State hoodie, to open that gift on Christmas morning and to find this fleece garbage bag right here. <laughs> Who the heck? The most disappointing Christmas of all time. What do you do with that, right? What do you do with something like that? Please remove that screen so we can move on. <laughs> you know, there's nothing worse than, than knockoff gifts. And so if we're going to be people who re-gift hope, we need to make sure it's authentic hope. We need to make sure that our, that our hope is based on the promises in the word of God before we go re-gifting it to someone else. Because the last thing we want to do is re-gift this knockoff counterfeit hope that's only going to leave them feeling disappointed. We want to give them a true, genuine hope. The only authentic hope is the hope found in the promises of God. Hope placed in anything else will disappoint. I love this monologue that's happening in Psalms 42. Uh, the psalmist is kind of having this conversation with himself, and he says this, Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? Some of you have asked yourself that question this week. Why do I feel so bummed? Why do I feel so discouraged? And the psalmist says, oh, I got a solution. I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. The answer to you this morning, if you feel discouraged, if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling down, is to place your hope in the one true God. He's the only hope that will keep us fulfilled. He's the only hope that will not lead to disappointment. In Hebrews 6, it says, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. The hope in God is an anchor for our souls. No matter what the storms of life throws at us, we can be secure in him. Anything else is a knockoff. If we've learned anything these past 18 months with the, the pandemic, if we've learned anything, we know that nothing in our world is stable. We can't place our hope in, in, in stock market. We can't place our hope in government. We can't place our hope in the healthcare system. We can't place our hope in, in jobs or retirement. We can't do any of those things because none of them are secure. You see, the only Thing that's secure, that's an anchor for our souls, is when we place our hope in the one true God, in the person of Jesus Christ that God sent to us that very first Christmas, has this gift that brought hope and joy and love and peace. I just heard the other day, uh, 
you know, that the stock market took this, this downward spiral on Friday. Did you guys hear about that? This downward spiral on Friday because there was a, 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 another, another, another um, virus detected in southern Africa. Now, I don't know if you guys sense anything with that, but th- there's another strand of the virus happening on the other side of the globe. And so our stock market crashes. Do you know how many people have their hope in this stock market? That is so, so unpredictable. But I want you to know, man, as we, as we lead into this Christmas season, as we prepare our hearts for the arrival of Christ, as we focus on the hope that came through the person of Christ, no matter what happens economically, politically, relationally, financially, no matter what happens, that is like an anchor for our souls, that we can grab hold of this anchor and we can be secure in the person of Jesus, no matter the storms that life brings us. If we're going to re-gift hope, we must make sure that it's authentic hope. And secondly, if we're going to re-gift hope, we need to share this hope with those around us. Look what it goes on to say in, in Luke chapter 33. It says, Jesus parents were amazed at what was being said about him. And Simeon blessed him and he said to Mary that to the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. But I I love that first sentence. It says that his parents were amazed at what was being said. You see, God used Simeon to speak hope and to speak encouragement to Mary and Joseph about this child that, that, that she had just delivered. She knew who he was. They had received message from the angel of God and confirming in their spirit of who this was, that this was their son, but this, this child was different, that he was the very son of God. He was God in the flesh, but, but God used Simeon too on that day of his dedication to speak these words of hope and to speak these words of encouragement and his parents were amazed. I mean, if we're gonna be people who re-gift hope, we're gonna share this hope with those around us. Just a, just a couple weeks ago, I ran into one of uh, the gentlemen from the Grove Church uh, out at lunch around town and, and he pulled me to the side and he said, hey, pastor, I just need to tell you this. And he began to speak these words of encouragement and these words of hope over me and and over the Grove Church. And it was things that he would have never known, but I was wrestling with myself. I was wrestling with, man, am I leading well in this season? Am I I leading people with the truth and the answers that they're looking for? God, am I the right person for this role? God has this, this is a, this is a God honest truth right here. This is an insecurity I have and I'll share with you guys because I know that it's in our weakness that we create community. Oftentimes, I, in this past week in our 10-year celebration and seeing what's happening, oftentimes I question and say, man, has this church outgrown my leadership? Has the church grown beyond me? Am I still fit to lead this church? And it was in one of those days that I was battling that. And I was wrestling with those insecurities and those weaknesses. And this gentleman took time to pull me aside and said, hey, I just want to share this with you. And he spoke hope. And he spoke encouragement. And I'm so grateful that he didn't just think those thoughts, but he shared them with me. Because it meant so much. And it gave me this boost of confidence and hope of thinking, man, like, God, I believe it. I believe it. I believe those words. I believe that this is what you have for me. And oftentimes we can think the nicest things about people, but we don't have the boldness to say it. And I want to encourage us. I want to challenge us in this Advent season. If we're going to be people who re-gift hope, maybe that we may find people in the coming weeks that we speak hope over. We don't just think it, but we share it over them. We share it with them and we bring encouragement and hope. And just like Mary and Joseph, it says they were amazed at what was being said. The individuals that we encounter would be amazed at what God's doing and restoring their hope. Look what it says in Ephesians 4. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. 1 Peter 3. If anyone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. 
Man, everything we say should be helpful and encouraging. We should always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And I was thinking about this this week and preparing for today. I was thinking about the numerous individuals that are part of this church that are, that are so disciplined at sharing their hope with others. I think about Mike and Danae Tebow and, and, Rob and Cindy Legassi who speak hope over these young marriages and, and so many married couples within our church. I, I think of, uh, of Bob Armstrong and John Moyce who, who speak hope over our homeless community week in and week out as they deliver meals out to the camps and share the hope that they have in the person of Jesus. I think of, uh, of Mike Carver and, and Adam Evelyn who share the hope that they have as they walk out this thing called recovery with men multiple days a week. I think of Richard Johnson and Josh Gerard who, who weekly serve and share the hope of Christ with our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in the RISE ministry. I, I, I think of Miss Connie Smith who's sharing hope in Christ as she, as she leads a group of men and women through the process of grief. And what does it look like to grieve biblically? I think of all of these men and these women who are so intentional of sharing their hope with those around them. And I pray that in these, these coming weeks, those of us who, who maybe feel hopeful, that we could re-gift one of the greatest gifts we've ever received. You see, we receive this hope through the person of Christ. And as, he, as we welcomed him and invited him into our life, we surrendered ourselves to, to his lordship and we walk in hope. I pray that in the coming weeks that we could re-gift that hope to, to others in this room and others all around our community, maybe family members and coworkers or neighbors that are hurting and struggling and, and feeling hopeless, that we have a gift that we can give them. Many of you are here this morning and you're feeling hopeless. Maybe like the psalmist said, why am I so discouraged? Why do I feel so sad? I, I would love to share just with a moment, for a moment, the hope that I have. The same hope that is also available to you. You see, because it's in my moments of grief that I, I cling to this anchor of hope and the promises of God's word that says that he's close to those who are brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. It's in those moments of sadness and grief and the loss of a loved ones that I can cling to that and I can say, man, I know in this moment, I know what I feel, but I know the promises of God and his promises that he's close to me in this moment. You see, in my moments of, of confusion or my moments of inadequacy, I can cling to the, the promise and I can hold to this anchor of hope that it says, God's word says to lean not on my own understanding, but to acknowledge him in all of his ways, to place my trust and my faith in him and he'll make my paths straight. I, I can cling to that truth and that promise of his word when he says that anyone who lacks wisdom, just ask and he'll give it to you generously. I can cling to that anchor in my grief, in my inadequacies, in my confusion, in my anxiety. I mean, many, many people dealing with anxiety and depression, especially this time of year, I can cling to the promises of God. I can have this eager anticipation, this hope-filled thought that God's promises to me is to not be anxious about anything, but to pray about everything. And his promise says when we do that, that, that he will give us a peace that far exceeds anything we've ever experienced. And he'll guard our hearts and our mind in Christ Jesus. I can cling to this anchor of hope in my grief and in my confusion and in my inadequacies and in my anxiety and my guilt and in my shame. And in the moments when I'm overcome by, by my past decisions and my mistakes. I can allow the enemy to get the best of me and my emotions can go all over the place or I can grab tight to this anchor of hope and I can cling to these promises that God says, you know what, that if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you and purify you of all unrighteousness. This promise where he tells me that there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ, that the wages of sin is death, yes, but the gift of God is eternal life made possible through his son, Christ Jesus. You see, church, this hope that I have, 
It's an authentic hope because it's based solely on the promises of God. It's not based on anything this world can offer me. It's not based on anything that the media can feed me, but it's based solely on the promises of God that he's given to me and he's given to you. And I just want you to hear this truth as we wrap up our time this morning. I mean, if you're feeling hopeless, there's hope in the person of Jesus. You see, God is a God of mercy and a God of love. And God loved you so very much that he willingly sent his son Jesus from heaven to earth to live and to die. That he willingly went to the cross and took on the weight of our sin. He was crucified and buried. And on the third day, he rose from the grave, conquering death, conquering sin. And his promise and his word is that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall receive this gift of forgiveness and salvation and hope. And I want you to know that truth. I want you to know the truth that there's a God crazy in love with you. He so loves you that he willingly gave his one and only son that you might be restored into relationship with him, that you might be redeemed and forgiven and walk in hope. Amen? This is what I want to do. I want to just bow our head and just kind of a, a spirit of prayer right now. I just want to pray over us before the team comes out and leads us in, in one last song. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the hope that you make available to, to each and every one of us. The hope that is not shaken, the hope that is secure, the hope that's rooted in your promises. And Father, I pray for those of us here today who, who are confessed followers of you, who have received this gift of hope. God, I pray that in the coming weeks, would you give us the boldness Holy Spirit, would you lead us with, with impressions to, to speak out and to, to speak encouragement, and to speak hope over those that we encounter, whether it be in our neighborhoods or our homes or in our workplaces. God, may we be vessels of your hope. May we re-gift that hope to those all around us. And Father, I pray right now that if there's any person sitting in this room or within the sound of my voice that, that's feeling hopeless, that's feeling like their, their circumstance or their situation, that there, there is no hope, there is no light at the end of the tunnel, there, there is no way out. Lord, I pray that this truth of your love for them, this truth of your desire to redeem and to restore them, to fill them with your hope would penetrate their hearts and their minds this very moment. Lord, that we would know that the way to this hope, the way to receive this gift is by placing our faith in the person of Jesus. Placing our faith that Jesus truly is the Son of God. That he truly left heaven and came to earth to die for our sins. He was crucified and buried, but he rose from the grave. And by placing our faith and our belief in the person of Jesus and his death, in his burial and his resurrection, that we would receive this gift of forgiveness and salvation where we begin to walk with you and your purposes and your hope and your peace and your love and your joy. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. What a great message. We hope that you felt encouraged this week, Grove Church. I don't know where you're at spiritually. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time. Maybe you don't know him at all. Maybe you're not quite sure where you sit. It's our number one goal here at the Grove Church to help you take that step into a relationship with Jesus so that way we know that we know Jesus. If you don't know where you're at, if you know you haven't confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to go to this link right here. We'll walk you through the gospel very clearly because we want to equip you. We want to help you grow in your faith. We want to see you have that abundant life that Jesus promised. It says in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 
but I have come to give you life and life to the fullest. We want to see all of you having that life to the fullest with Jesus. Please go to this link right here. That way we can help you step into a relationship with Jesus. Grove Church, thank you so much for how you support the work of ministry financially. It's because of that generosity that we're able to be the hands and feet of Jesus that we need to. We can do the online experience. We can serve our community the way that we do. We can plant more churches. We can cultivate faith. We can do all these things because of your generosity. We have a couple safe and secure ways to give online. You can go to this link right here. I just want to encourage you to keep on trusting God, knowing that he can do far more with our 10% than we could ever do if we kept our 100. You guys have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.